Yeah, go ahead and call so me. Victoria, Victoria, and find the Mrs. Media. My son reflection. has been quite busy. Um, Wait, he did give me. Dick is on. Here's what he said. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. There he is. And so right. I got it. It's okay. like video <laughs> editing. I haven't done it. So yeah. It's really good. So oh, his advice, two words. Okay. So you won't measure it. Excellent. All right. I would like to call the meeting to order. First order of business in the agenda is a short reflection by Mark. God, it comes up right away. Doesn't it? Uh, well, I just want to, I, you know, you remember Tim Hahn, former uh, tree board member and uh, tree board chair, who uh, uh, was now happily retired, I think, in a San Juan somewhere. Anyway, I found this a compilation of quotes by trees. So I've got material here for probably the next three years of meetings. <laughs> oh, mercifully, I won't use them all. There's one here that caught my eye that I just wanted to share because uh, we saw uh, Sarah okay. and I went to a, uh, an event at the Milwaukee uh, Forest uh, last, I guess it was weekend before last, and there was a speaker there named Roger Fernandez, and he's a Native American storyteller, among many other things that he does. He was telling a story. He told the story about uh, why Native, he said, he said, he said, Native Americans often greet each other with their arms raised like this, and they often they often part ways by the same kind of gesture. He said that that was because that was because that's the shape of the upper branches on cedar trees. Um, he told us, and I have no reason to doubt him. But anyway, and I was looking through this little list, and I came upon this one a quote from a woman named Jennifer Smith from a book called Sacred Woods and the Lore of Trees. I've not heard of it, maybe you know. Since uh, humans first utilized wood for fire, tools, and utensils, certain trees have held a special significance as both practical providers and powerful spiritual presences. Specific trees vary between different cultures and geographic areas, but those held to be sacred shared certain traits in common, unusual size or beauty, wide range of materials they provided, unique physical characteristics, or simply the power of the tree's spirit could grant it a central place in the folklore and mythology of a culture. Even today, certain trees capture our imagination. Majestic oak, the ancient yew, evergreens we bring into our homes each winter, all are reminders of the power the trees could have in our lives. Um, I guess it was that line, unique physical characteristics that uh, uh, and meaning to, to the culture that got my attention to that. So i share that with you all. We, we will get back to that when we talk about the I the tree day. I just thought of it yesterday. <laughs> hey, thank you. Introduction. We do have some visitors today, so we can introduce ourselves. I'll start. My name is Elizabeth. I'm the assistant planner with the city of Lake Forest Park. I'm my name is Sarah Phillips. I'm the chair of climate action. I'm Larry Goldman, uh, city council, and the liaison to the board. I'm Mark Phillips. I'm the vice chair of the board. I'm Doug Sprugel. I'm the chair of the board. Grace Bell, I'm a visitor, and I found out about the tree board. You were there. <laughs> you were there at the city picnic. Okay. You're you're checking us out, I believe. I don't. Yes. <laughs> I'm John Brew. I'm with the Stewardship Foundation. Here to learn what the tree board's doing. I'm Victoria Kutel, the tree board member. I'm Stacy Spain, also a tree board member. Dick, you're in the upper left hand corner. Uh, I'm Dick Olmstead, another tree board member. Mark? Mark Hoffman, Community Development Director. And we have Sarah there again. I'm not quite sure why. She's sharing her presentation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. 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 Thank you all. Uh, adoption of agenda. Anybody got any problems with the agenda? So I don't have a problem with it, but I've been hoping we might spend uh, a few minutes, if we have the time, to revisit the subject that we've talked about a few times, and that is the possibility of planting a tree uh, this fall or late winter or sometime when it's appropriate. Instead of just for Arbor Day? Or instead of waiting till Arbor Day? Yeah, I'm not going to hard until it's summer again. Anyway, maybe, maybe we could add that onto new business. We'll see how things go before. We'll see how things go. We'll see where we have the full, the full schedule. Though. We can add that. If we get to it. We get to it. Yep. Okay. Uh, minutes. 
Any comments on the minute? All in favor of a vote. Oh, we have a, a move to approve the minutes. Yes, I move that we approve the minutes. Anybody else? Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Minutes are approved. Um, we are not going to have any comments. Do you all, does anybody want to make a comment? Yeah. Great. I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> we'll okay. Reports and announcements. <laughs> not quite sure what we would have in the constitutional report or announcement. So. Right. Well, actually, no, this is where you give our. Uh, uh, from the yeah. council, I, yeah. I think everything I would say would probably be, well, most of it would be covered in your business. So. We're currently working through the budget. After that, we're in a pivot into the comp plan. Uh, so thank you for your feedback. Uh, the planning commission that on board and gave us a draft. And so we're going to have to go through chapter by chapter. I think the time for a question. Mm -hmm. I just want, I'm just curious if anyone got any sort of report back from uh, Mr. Snedden about the court presentation. I think he was going to go to a meeting that following day. Oh, okay. That's probably item D. Got it. Okay. We we there we do have an update from Sound Transit about awesome. the same article will cover that. Well, I guess we we've reorganized our, our standard agenda with the reports and announcements second or early. Is that anybody care if that's a good idea or a bad idea? Well, I, your, yeah. I feel like it's better than at the end when I keep, we keep running out of time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's keep it that way, really, but it's, we, okay. do, we always sort of had it two different places in the agenda and everything where everything went. So having it in one place and early, but everybody's still awake. Is... Okay. I've got a question that possibly Mark has an answer to. Um, are there is there any new reports or announcements about the uh, work group that I know was waiting for someone who was going to come in and pull it together and lead it? It sounded like that may have started to move forward last time I talked to the, you. The council approved the contract. Okay. Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, the short update we gave uh, at Sarah had the same question last night at CIC. Last Friday, I met with Cascadia to kick it off. That was the internal meeting. This week, we're going to trade calendars. After I factored in budget, comp plan, and all the other things, they're going to cherry pick two or three options for a doodle pool and send it out to the seven members, likely Friday, Monday-ish. And then the selection, hopefully ends with a date in late October for that initial meeting, elect a chair, vice chair, and then get started. Everyone's on board. Great, good to hear. Okay. Actually, one more question that uh, sort of asked while Larry, Larry had the floor. Um, is there any movement on our other potential board members other than Grace? Um, my understanding, talking to Tom, uh, Mayor French, is that there aren't any active applicants, either, at least as of a few weeks ago, there were not any other active applicants. So the other two applicants we thought we had changed our mind for one reason or another. I believe so. Or, we, okay. or, or, weren't, or weren't forwarded for whatever reason. Everything so, is uh, through the mayor. There is an active recruitment right now, especially for Planning Commission and Tree Board and I believe Parks Board. So we thought we had a couple of candidates who we did have a couple of candidates who we thought were you know had made an application, but it sounds like they've withdrawn them with their names. And so I can stop asking that every week. So well, yeah, I'll maybe asking about Grace. <laughs> yes. Yes. We are accepting new. Yeah. Okay. Old business. We don't have any old business. Uh, so new business. Our first business is Sarah Bell's talking about the Climate Action Committee report. Um, I should just say I read that we're Monthly, I pulled his mailing from the city and saw a link to the CIC's report. I thought it sounded really cool, but since we had sort of a, a hotline for her, yeah. I thought it'd be really nice to get her to talk about it. Well, I'm going to get fixed over here with my computer. Um, yes, it, uh, the, the council, we presented to the council in May and they accepted, they accepted it, um, which makes it a um, policy document. And uh, that means that as they're thinking through things, they will use that as a frame to make some decisions. While she's making me look smart over here, we're going to go to another. I just wanted to pass out some things about the Neowaki Forest. 
I know some of you haven't been there yet. I can't believe the tree board people haven't been to the Miyawaki Forest in Shoreline. But the trees are, they we planted them 11 months ago, and they're, there are three trees that are about 12 feet tall, and um, other ones that are, um, it's its a fulgent chest. You can hardly ever get to use that. Because I it's perfect for a forest. Um, so I hope we're going to have a birthday party. Uh, on uh, December 8th, Sunday, December 8th, in the evening, the, t the twilight, we're going to light up the forest with twinkle lights. I hope you'll come. You know, we could, they, these people could see what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't work. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so a little filler there. My name is Sarah Phillips, and I'm the chair of the Climate Action Committee. And we have been um, working since uh, uh, at least uh, about a year and a half, maybe two years. I I have kind of lost track, but we're done. And um, this is our our opening page, and um, this is our mascot. And our mascot is a kokanee from, uh, and it was drawn by the young man Austin, who does this, did the same, uh, the the uh, turn the Jersey barriers into art. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah selling so stickers as well. Yes, yeah, so stickers <laughs> everywhere. Um, and um, well, this is our current mascot. There was a moment when we thought this should be our uh, <laughs> mascot. That is, uh, you know, when you're talking about climate, you're talking about hair and fire. Um, and I was thinking, um, I listened to Hillary Franz years ago, um, and she said, the thing that struck, struck me was, she said, we don't know what to replant in the burned out forest because we don't know what's going to survive in 50 years. And then in the paper just yesterday, but these are current, you know, just sort of flash points of what's going on. But today, yesterday, they said the fires are so hot that that, you know, usually it, the fires burn and it opens up the seed pods for some of the forest. They're so hot, the seeds aren't, for, aren't opening. And the repetition of the fires, the wildfires, makes the ground so hard that it's more difficult to plant. And in the past, we've had sort of a process of like, there's a forest fire and then the forest service comes in and plants and there's sort of a reforestation process. And because of the number of forest fires, they're, they're so far behind in replanting. Um, so climate affects forests, that's all I'm going to say there. Um, one of the things that um, uh, we see that the effects of climate change have a local impact. Um, and I, th this is not rocket science, right? You all know this. Um, uh, uh, um, there, um, it's it's hotter, it's drier. Um, our gardens are. Um, I got the strangest bugs in my garden. Well, and I have so many bugs, so many bugs. Mm. Um, but the other day, a deer walked by. I looked in my window and walked down my driveway, which was the first time. But there's a lot of stuff around the garden club saying uh, the things that uh, everybody I know said they had to pull things out this year of their garden that just didn't survive the, the winter. And it wasn't a catastrophic winter, it was just the combination. Um, that climate change is, um, um, we're worried, begin to worry about what insects are going to come that have come from the, um, uh, I'm from New England, we used to worry, we're worried about. Lyme disease and um, Nile, Nile, Blue Nile, West, uh, West Nile, Nile, West Nile, and apparent and ticks, and they're kind of worried those are migrating towards us. Um, and I have a friend who um, had bought uh, the thing I love about living here is no mosquitoes. Right, right. Your porch. I have no screens on my, and um, but I've seen a few mosquitoes uh, for the first time. Anyway, those kinds of changes are happening. Wildfires and uh, and smoke increases asthma in our children um, and that whole all those kinds of things and uh, we begin to see more sorts of further rain. Uh, so, well, one of the things we decided to do was make sure that we were talking to our citizens and we did a number of things. We did an outreach to um, uh, a, a survey we sent out. Four hundred some odd people responded and we've been out in the community very consistently at every event that we can possibly think of to have to engage in people in conversation. 
And uh, what we find is that Lake Forest Park, like the nation, is very concerned or somewhat concerned about climate. I put out in the last, uh, at the farmer's market and at Picnic in the Park, uh, something from the Yale Climate Conversations, which said, where do you stand on climate? And it was, uh, you know, hair on fire. That couldn't have been the first category. But so I'm very concerned, concerned. I don't, uh, middle, midland, down to I don't care. And then everybody that we talked to were clustered around concerned and very concerned. It's this consistent response. So we know that people in Lake Forest are concerned about this. So what we did was we um, developed a climate action plan. And here's a copy of, of it. And they're, uh, they're online and easy to get to. We think it's fabulous, of course. Um, it, was a, it was an exciting experience because we wrote on Zoom and we were not on Zoom, on uh, Google Google Docs. And all 10 of us were in there editing and we made kind of a mess of things and um, we got everything we wanted in there. And then we uh, hired a consultant to help us with the graphics that we're going to get together. And we came up and our, um, and uh, you know, I just, our methods were just what you would expect. You know, we talked to people, we reviewed the documents, what other people were, were doing. We engaged in conversations, we built collaborations, we did. We talked with other jurisdictions and we looked at uh, the climate action plans from various different locations. Um, and, uh, and what we found from the county, this was a county data that they gave us, was that these are our emissions and the green is from transportation. So the, the, the city of Lake Forest Park has made a commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030. So we got a very short runway. Um, and uh, in order to do that, you can begin to see that the major emphasis is going to be on transportation. And so that's on road vehicles, and those are like cars and trucks. Off road vehicles are um, big machines, you know, a whole back hose and ski doos, those my category of off road. Um, and then, um, it, then we were assigned a certain amount of the air traffic, uh, air transportation, which, um, you know, they looked at all the travel in and out of the airports and they just, the county assigned us. So we don't know, it's based on income and um, the, the assumption being the higher the income, the more traveling you do. Um, the, I think in the, the one that the issue that, uh, Committee that Tracy was talking about is going to look more specifically at that and see if they can pull that out a little bit more to make sure, see if that's correct. The others is from buildings and energy, and uh, most of that is from gas. About 71% of the citizens of Lake Forest Park have gas coming to their house, uh, and that's in heating, um, uh, stoves. Um, there's a cult around um, gas stoves. That say they're better than anything else. Uh, so we have to, have to deal with that sort of issue. Um, and um, so, but gas coming in, there are gas lines every, uh, all throughout the city of Lake Forest Park serving our, our citizens. And one of the issues that we're confronting most recently is, uh, at work consistently, is people say, well, the lights go out and I don't have any power and I need to have the gas to um, keep the house. That's an issue that people are talking about. And, it's a legitimate issue, and um, we're going to try and figure out how to um, fix that. Um, sometimes it's not an issue because you need electricity to turn on your gas, but um, well, at least blow the heat through the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the other categories are um, are uh, refrigerants, which turn out to be like um, you know when you walk into the grocery store and you walk. The big cabinets that are frozen, those are refrigerants in there. Pretty fair. Not very good. Old air conditioning units have this refrigerant. It's, a, it's an issue that needs to be dealt with. And then um, solid waste. Um, have our allocation of solid waste. Um, and this is kind of an interesting thing to think about. It begins to lead us where we want to go. But the good news is we don't have to do We don't have to solve all the problems. That's good news. If this is a can chart, I, can you go back a slide? I of course. This may not be something you know, but do you know if the natural gas component there is natural gas leaking into the atmosphere or natural gas being burned? Burned. Being burned. Okay, thanks. Yes, you. Because 
Dr. Because natural gas in the atmosphere is also very powerful greenhouse gas. I don't. I believe this is gas that is coming. Totally. Yeah. Um. So, in terms of the solutions to the problem, the top line on there, the dotted line, is if we do nothing, we're cooked. As it were. Um, the uh, blue section is um, how much if the state and federal government is working on to reduce emissions. Um, and, and I'm sure you all know that the city of Lake Forest Park has taken a position on the um, uh, initiative 2117 when they took the no position on it. That's not speaking out of school, is it? No, that's what, um, yeah, the city council unanimous, unanimously voted to uh, recommend a no vote on 2117. And then it is, I believe, on the agenda for one of our October meetings, uh, 2066, that's the natural gas one. So we're going to have a public hearing about if we should take a position as a city on that. And 2117 is, uh, is uh, an initiative to eliminate the Climate Commitment Act, the, the uh, cap, and, cap and invest, which for, provides an enormous amount of money for roads, uh, the transportation, the elimination of Sometimes we're past that blue area gets shrunk. I, yes, I believe that's correct. That would be correct. That we would have much more problems with us, our, our streams, our, our forests, our transportation. Um, and then that green part is what local jurisdictions are doing. Um, and, um, and, and so all of those things together is the, is the way that we think we can get to the reduction of um, uh, greenhouse emissions and our targets, but um, not near the national targets, are uh, ninety-five percent by twenty fifty. It, uh, it's ambitious and are re sort of required. In this we have um, so our climate uh, uh, plan has three primary goals, and they are reduced emissions and the enhanced uh, Lake Forest Park ecosystem. And increased resiliency. So we're sense we're, our sense is we want to reduce, we want to enhance, and then we want to build resiliency. Sort of three categories of things, and those three categories are in um, five action areas, and it's transportation and mobility, built environment, the natural environment, consumption and solid waste, and uh, community resilience and well-being. And those are not they look equal, but as we look at what we need to do, they're not quite the same. Um, we have a vision of the future, and I'm just going to focus on um, the third one, which I hope I, which it, I think it says, uh, which is the natural uh, environment and ecosystems, and that is the one really that is focused on forestry and um, maintaining our, our natural forest. And that the vision for the future there is the community protects, conserves, and restores our natural ecosystems, uh, landscapes, and habitats. But we have one for each of those five areas of vision. Um, um, uh, so in the, our climate plan itself, we have those five focus areas. Each of the five focus areas has 57 thing, 58 things that we think need to happen. Um, for example, we, we think the city should never buy a gas-powered vehicle again. I was going to look at that fleet stuff. Um, so they ought to buy electric vehicles. They ought to buy electric tools. Those kinds of things in terms of it. So that would be an action is the reduction of purchase. And then kind of uh, 91 sort of implementing ideas. And these are just um, sort of what our best thinking at this stage and at this place. Um, it's not the final word. And this, uh, just, this is just the structure of how we did it. We had... We, we took an area and then we would have, um, we'd say electrify the city fleet, and then we'd have these uh, set of uh, proposed activities under each one. This is just sort of a guide to reading. Um, and then, um, uh, so this is just built up for that electrify the fleet. We don't develop a transition plan and then increase um, the number of uh, municipal EVs to 100% by um, 2035. So we had a series of things that we suggested that they do. The um, the we're the climate action plan is just like you. You know, we're just people who come to meetings and do the best we can. And our fundamental recommendation was that you could not move this issue without hiring full time staff to 
being a climate manager. And I have to say that we modeled this in part on the early days of this tree board where they said we have to have an arborist, we have to have an arborist, even though there was a lot of you know hesitancy and those just pushing and pushing to make sure that the canopy and uh, was was preserved and that there were resources available. So we think that our climate manager could um, reduce the local emissions by doing our part and um, sort of manage that. There, there is money on the table, but you got to write a grant for it. And I'm not, uh, and I, I try uh, at this stage of my life, I'm just saying, well, that's not my job. It's not my job. That's a climate manager's job. So we were saying that that needed to happen. Um, and so our implementation strategy for how you do this is we, uh, are depending on leadership from the city council, a climate manager and uh, a, an engaged citizenship, citizen, citizen. And- We just, Sarah, so there's, there's going to be a, a, a committee that's going to be working on this issue, representing different groups within the city. Or is that to get that diagram with the climate sorry. manager? Would you ask me that question in a different way? Uh, Victoria asked you about the committee. I was asking about oh. the committee that's forming out that you're going to be a part of. Mm -hmm. Is that that's, is that is that part of what the, the climate manager's job would be working with that committee so they'd be in that box or or their community? Or I think that this is really out. This committee that uh, that we're on is going to be outside of this in one sense. Its job is to. Uh, is to work with the planning commission on their document for the climate element of the comp plan. So we will be working with a consultant who leads us through that. So it's a little separate. It's it's unless Mark has a clearer picture, it's it'll, I think it's evolutionary, but I think they are going to stand in different places. Yeah, that that is a temporary task force to perform the scope of work of the five hundred thousand dollar climate uh, grant funded through the Climate uh, Commitment Act, primarily through June, and then we'll take it to city council and then the task force ends. A new uh, program manager would be more involved long-term with the implementation measures. So, thank you, Mark. Um, so that we'll see how that rolls out. Have, uh, I think it'll be very interesting. Um, Sorry, just a question. I thought, isn't the comprehensive plan going to be adopted yes. relatively soon? I mean, you're right. talking about the committee that you're except uh, hasn't even formed yet. So <laughs> I could address that. Um, so yes, the bulk of the comprehensive plan will be adopted by December of this year. The addendum to the climate section is technically not due until 2029. We are accelerating that four years up to 25 through this task force. Okay. So. Basically, yes, it's a it's a it'll be six months after the main comp plan update, but that's four and a half years ahead of so. Oh yeah, I just that's, that's, if she had to do her entire job in two months, I thought that's a little, <laughs> a little <laughs> random, I say. Well, we'll see. Right? Right. Yeah. Well, I just want to say yeah. that the client manager didn't get into the uh, mayor's um, budget. Uh, but they mm -hmm. uh and, and in part because as you know, the, the climate uh, the climate. The city budget is uh, very tight, but um, through the diligent work of the of the administration and the and the council, they've identified a new funding source, which is a franchise fee, which would pay for a city a, a climate manager. So that is not that's still in the evolutionary place, but there's talk about how how in fact a climate manager could come on board. It would be a franchise fee on solid waste. So there'd be an additional cost for people uh, to get their solid waste picked up. Um, but it would, but we believe that the impact would be uh, of incredible service to the city um, in terms of a reduction of emissions, developing resiliency and, and, and maintaining our, our natural e ecosystems. So that's on the table. Um, nothing is um, set. The council has to, they have to run it up the trap lines and then they have to vote on it and they have to talk to the public about it. But that will be on, a, as I understand, and those of you who know more to interrupt, it's a relatively short timeline where that would happen, um, like November 
Um, and um, and I just have to say, it's the happiest thing that's happened to me. <laughs> I mean, it's just an amazing thing that we may be, in fact, be able to get a climate action manager. We may be able to take some really significant inroads on this issue. Um, so the other thing is I just want to point out that we do have a whole section here on forests. And we're, the first thing we say is that we want to support the tree board's policies and strategies to protect large stature stature species and with dense wood and whatever it was on. That we are we, we want to work with the tree boards. We want to make sure that the things that the tree board is, is working on are things that we work on. We're, we need to increase the forest if we want to increase sequestration. We already have a baseline and as nice as it is, it doesn't get us further. Um, what gets us further is more. And the and we want to talk with people about how Forest and sequestration work, carbon sequestration work. It's a long process. But I, I you know, if you, if you want to skip everything and just read that section, that'd be good. That'd be fun. And I'm I'm gonna step out for just one second and say we're doing one more thing that the Climate Action Committee is doing, and that is in the Commons. You know, they, all of you've been to the Commons and you're look at it, the stage is here, and over to the right hand side, there's a huge brown wall. We've gotten permission from Merlon Geyer to develop a climate hub where we're going to put a big mural and then information from various groups. So if the tree board wanted to say, you know, here are the 10 most important things we need to know about trees, they'd have a bulletin board and if they wanted to, you know, take three months to keep that up there and, and there'd be other boards. We're going to do the climate hero of the quarter and, um, I don't know, there'll be fish and mm -hmm. trees and wonderful things. And we're going to have a kickoff um, on October 26th. And we are going to have, um, we're going to imagine this, the Climate Hub. And uh, we're inviting, uh, we'd like to invite the tree board to come and set up a table and talk about trees and climate. Um, and um, we hope you can do that. It's, on, it's from 10 in the morning to 2. Where? I'd like to see those. Laser trees all over. <laughs> I wanted a big one. I wanted to. I wanted to have a laser tree on the wall, big beach one. So I was a little disappointed. In what it's uh, anyway, if, there, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to. Just a comment about that. About this. So we're going to do this. We have to do it this meeting. Yes. Okay, yes. So <laughs> yeah. Well, we, you know, part of it was we were so and we had, you know, how it is. We saved the spot, the time at the Commons, and we weren't sure what we were going to do. We didn't know if there was going to be a manager. We didn't know what. So we put it off and put it off, and then thought we'd operate around the clock as a as a proceeding. And to, to to sort of have a conversation where all the um, the stewardships coming, they said. Um, and we're inviting all such people to 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 take what they're doing and uh, look at the plan for focus. I have a quick question, Sarah. Are you guys focused on um, just activities that impact the Lake Forest Park area, or are you sort of focused on climate preservation activities that people can do that would sort of affect the greater climate, not just locally? Um, what my answer is that it's a huge mosaic. Yeah, if we're going to get to um, significant uh, reductions. It's a huge thing that everybody has to do their piece, and we've got a piece. And if we don't do our piece, the mosaic falls apart. Yeah. But what we are doing is, uh, and what we what we began to do, and I think the climate manager could enhance, is um, develop the north end cities. So Shoreline, Lake Forest Park. Kenmore, Woodenville, and Bothell have a natural affinity, and uh, the east side's doing that. So, you know, the, the difference between Kenmore and Lake Forest Park is who provides their electricity, but everybody needs solar. Solar doesn't reduce our emissions, but it, is, it enhances our um, uh, the grid reliability and those kinds of things, because um, we get our, you know, so, and, and we were talking and we were saying, we, sh we should just do the same things we've done over and over again, because people don't want to buy a new stove until they want to buy a new stove. And they're not paying attention to which is the best thing until they're ready. So we were thinking we just have 
Uh, Let's keep rotate. We get these. We get five programs and kind of keep running them through with these five mm -hmm. things. But that's sort of in the dream stage. But working collaboratively in the North End is something that I think makes sense because our houses are the same. Our transportation issues are for the most part the same, and and it uh, represents an opportunity to to use resources better. But we're part of the what the council has agreed to is through the county, the capable of the King County Cities Cooperative or something. Sorry about collaboration. Kind of collaboration. <laughs> those all those cities have agreed to reduce reduce emissions by um, to, uh, on the same targets. So all of the cities in King County are working in the same direction. And you know that sort of spills out the the, the initiative that um, is up on the capital capital invest was a way of getting money to the whole state. Um, and the notion of what leadership looks like is an important question. So our council taking leadership um, for, you know, they, they've already stopped buying um, power, excuse me, power tools with, um, with gas. Yeah. Our, our other guys are, are now using battery operated. It's so much better for them. Yeah. They're not breathing gas fumes. They're Hearing is retained for you know, so, so they're they're and then and then people people see that and then you know they're so there's a ripple effect but um, yeah we have the whole country and then the whole yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's great Thank so you. we want to do our part but what you said actually comes back to something I thought of a little bit earlier is it maybe ask you Larry is it thinkable that we might share a climate action but if you call a climate manager with one or more other cities? So I'll answer. Um, we did investigate that, okay. and the other cities basically said no. Okay. That they, not, not in a mean sort of way, just in a, they wouldn't be feasible sort of way. So we basically do need to bring on the person. Well, what a pleasure to work with you. I hope you will hope you'll join us on the twenty sixth. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks. You're welcome to stay if you want to, and you're welcome to leave if you want to. <laughs> yeah, you can find out. Sorry, we got great friends with us. Oh yeah. Why didn't my you feel pressured? So, so the next item in the agenda is the city attorney memo. And I think Mark, if I can ask you to talk about that, because you probably understand it pretty well. And I don't. From a layperson's perspective, <laughs> um, I'm certainly no attorney and I'm not going to reinterpret it, but essentially is saying that the um, the the item in question needs to be based on facts um, and a rational basis and the public need. And so the outline of it is the attorney's version of finding that balance between regulation and um, requiring certain trees to stay uh, and limiting um, private property rights. So that's what it's getting at. And the key is not that it can't be done, um, but it not be done in an arbitrary way. And that due process is important. Uh, and public comment, uh, the, the usual ordinance methods take care of that. And so that's basically what she wanted the tree committee to be cognizant of as you discuss it. I wasn't uh, present when that came up before in the past. So um, I'm under the impression this is a, a rehash or reminder, um, but I could be wrong. Yeah, it puts, just puts things in more concrete terms in our sort of wave, you know, vague arm waving. Yeah, we probably make sure, need to do this legally. Uh, she has provided us, I think, with a pretty decent explanation of what we want. So I guess my real question is, where does our explanation of how we we uh, came up with these numbers, how does that fit into the, to the legislative process? Well, it, eventually it goes into the recitals in the ordinance itself. It's the it's the basis for why 
the code changes exist, why 42 becomes 30. Uh, and to get there in your deliberations and discussions, you're, you're very knowledgeable. Uh, and so those discussions need to be based on that. Why is 30 important? Why is it, why is 30 important to retain as opposed to, Hey, I have a gut feeling. Let's just go with 30, you know, and that's, that's the primary difference she's getting at. Then there's a matter of degree, how restrictive. And uh, in any event, she will be aware and review of uh, the material, the draft materials, and have oversight over that and give advice. Um, but what she doesn't want to do is put her thumb on it and tell you what you should do right now. Okay. But the, I mean, the, the municipal code is not going to say, well, we chose 30 centimeters. No, 30 inches, 40 centimeters, kind of bad. 30 inches for red cedar because it has, it's a tree of great cultural importance. And we show 42 inches for big leaf maple. I mean, all, all that stuff is not going to go into the, no. into the municipal code, thank God. Yeah, typically it's it's cited in the ordinance by reference, you know, the, different, the tree report, for instance, that uh, came through this year, scientific studies, you know, uh, background on species, background on habitat, you know, other resources are cited as the justification. And then you get into um, what she is offering, which is a suggestion of why it's the public benefit. What is the public interest? And she could work with uh, the group on language. I think you have the overall framework on why trees are important. The specific words are key. We wouldn't want to be subject to a, a takings um, lawsuit is essentially what the memo is a reminder of. I guess maybe the answer is Drew probably mostly, and the rest of us work with her to find ways to describe what we did. Oh, it will sound good in court. Yeah, I'd be supportive in court. I, I can't write a legal statement. No, <laughs> you can. no, but we have ideas. Among yes, us, oh yeah, we do. Yeah, why? Yeah. And I think one of my questions about that is trying to confirm some of my suspicions about why why larger trees are important. Mm -hmm. So some of that would be good. I mean, we just heard a report about uh, that the city has uh, adopted apparently a policy of uh, wanting to improve our ecosystem uh, in response to climate change or global warming. That should yeah. be something there that would be a part of that. Why Why this improvement, why this change in the, in the size of trees is something that is of right. importance to the city. I guess, but I'm going back. Provide a little bit of extra context. So our the city attorney looks over every ordinance that the council considers and provides feedback, not about the policy itself, but about the framework. Okay. That does this ordinance seem likely to pass legal muster? And if she's concerned, then what sort of thing needs to be fixed to bring it up? And so it's really just a matter of making sure that we're on a sturdy legal foundation. I have no, I have no problem. I don't think we have a problem. Um, and uh, so coming up with reasons to support the things we will recommend, but I don't quite understand the mechanics of how that our reasons would get translated into something that actually becomes a city. I would say, I mean, th this very meeting, the fact that you are having these deliberations in an official city meeting, it's being recorded, there's minutes, mm -hmm. that itself is evidence that this is not done. I can send her disclaimer, I am also not a lawyer. But that provides evidence that you are being deliberative as opposed to arbitrary. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I am a lawyer. <laughs> oh, okay. That's yeah. probably just got solved. <laughs> I would just suggest that whenever we come up with the rationale has to pass this test, the lawyer, and I'm assuming the city lawyer is going to look at whatever ordinance we come to and the rationale that we have put forward for the changes and just make sure that it will pass the three part test um, to so that we can avoid any kind of like takings lawsuit. I don't know how that works in practice, like how you write down, how we write down our rationale. Is that something you have to write? Okay. So, my advice would be to basically write your own memo. So, you're going to suggest code amendments. It's basically the last page of your packet, but you will also, you can also send the city council a memo that over the course of a few pages explains your rationale. Right. So you're saying, okay, you're taking big leaf maple from 42 down to 30. In that memo, you can lay out your argument. 
And then that provides the supporting information that the city, it won't be in the municipal code, but the city can use that as a defense if anything comes up. So it's important that you have that sort of companion memo for whatever changes you're proposing. You exactly. Agree? And then those are cited in the recitals, the whereas, 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 and then you get to section two, which is the actual words in the municipal code that change. And that's the exhibit you have at the end of your packet. So I guess in practice, what I guess we can do is maybe Drew and I can work on a memo and then the tree board can approve it. Our, our lawyer can, <laughs> the tree board's personal lawyer can <laughs> I'll do a suggestion. We, well, we can, since, we, since, since Drew and I and, and, and Stacey don't constitute a, uh, a quorum, we can sort of send anything to you on to. Perfect. Yeah, and then do the do do the discussion and the work in this committee uh, session in this format recorded, just like the council member uh, mentioned. You know, with minutes, opportunity for comment, uh, public hearing later at city council, recommendation, opportunity for appeal, things like that, and and we'll take care of that. Thank you, thank you, you, and thank the city attorney because that would. But she provided quite a lot of wording to turn her on and put her on explanation. Yeah. <laughs> nice. All right. So exceptional trees. Um, I wanted to start a little bit talking about, about exceptional trees uh, before we start looking at the actual numbers we're proposing. Uh, I try to put this in some logical order. So our our uh, City code recognizes three categories of trees, and anybody who knows knows about them. Right? Drew is here again. Drew is here, apparently has spent the last week at her sister's wedding, and yes. her plane got was delayed. She was trying to get back in time for the trip, but her plane got delayed. So I've exchanged a couple of emails with her. But I was riding a bus while I was typing the email, and she was probably sitting in an airport, so they're not a hundred percent clear. Anyway, we had recognized three kinds of trees: significant, landmark. And exceptional. Uh, significant is any tree over six inches. That's basically any tree that comes under the city's jurisdiction. The city doesn't have any jurisdiction over anything less than, less than six inches. Uh, landmark trees is anything over 24 inches. Uh, and exceptional trees are bigger. And it's currently they're defined by this uh, this list of diameters here in the, in the, in the beginning of this page. Uh, and, that, and that's basically the framework we're working with, but we're sort of taking that as, as a uh, uh, jumping off point. The problem, first problem, is there's really no definition of exception. You can't go to a dictionary and say, well, exceptional is the top 4%. Um, any more than to that definition of A, a in, in that um, college class. So we're pretty much going with, you know, kind of a gut feeling for what constitutes exceptional. And other cities in the area, there's a, there's a nice little memo available or a booklet available about suggestions for, for regulating trees on city property. And it's, it tells us what all the other cities have for their regulations. But it turns out that most cities, most cities have a, a significant tree thing, a uh, diameter to which they don't think talk about it. And then they talk about landmark trees. Um, some cities call their landmark trees exceptional. But the diameter limit for a landmark tree in most cities is 24 inches. 24 inches is not an exceptional tree in Lake Forest Park. Over 10% of our trees are over, like, over 24 inches. So we could not, you know, we, we could not call our landmark trees exceptional. Like a 24 inch tree may be exceptional in Durian or something like that. I don't know. But a 24 inch tree is not here. So we have a separate category called exceptional, which most cities don't have. There's a few that do. Um, to have some you know a category that's better than just merely landmark. And obviously what we're doing today is talking about is you know trying to define landmark trees in a way that we're happy with or at least happier than we are with the current terms. Is, I there, could, is there a reason the other cities choose 24 inches? Um but for the landmark trees? Yeah. Well I think I think they basically feel that a 24 inch tree deserves more protection than a six inch tree. And that's sort of where they set the limits. So, you know, no, 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 don't, don't just take this tree down if it's in the way. You know, a, a tree over 24 inches is important. Yeah. Uh, that, that, 
I haven't read the other city's codes, obviously, but I think the basic idea is, you know, we've got, there's six inch trees around and they don't grow back, you know, stuff like that. Yes, we want to take care of them, but, you know, the odd six inch tree being killed, taken out, is not going to hurt the ecosystem much. When you start taking out 24 inch trees or larger, then you're having an impact on the forest. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm using my words to say what I think the other cities are saying. But the 24 is the same for us, right? 24 is our land, but I agree. Right. So, so those are the cities that I think Lake Forest Park is probably somewhat exceptional in having that other category. Yes. Yeah. We're about to get to that. Extremely large tree. Yes. Yeah. We're about to get to that. Uh, when you look at the city code, municipal code, exceptional appears, exceptionally appears a number of times in reference to trees, actually much more often than landmark does. Um, it's a lot of a lot of our sort of mission statement kind of thing to say what what Lake Forest values is exceptional trees. Um, I, say, I think I did a search and it appears nine times in the environmental protection part or the tree part. Uh, landmark trees appears like twice. So they say oh, we say over and over again in our sort of statement of what Lake Forest Park is all about that we think exceptional trees are really an important part of our system. Uh, they are also given more protection in the city code, a lot more protection in the city code than landmark trees. Um, Mark, please correct me if I'm wrong about this. I think I'm translating what Drew told me accurately. A landmark tree, if you want to take out a landmark tree, you have to get a major tree permit, uh, which means it's actually looked over by, our, uh, by uh, the city arborist, city urban forest planner. Um, if you want to take out an exceptional tree, you can, according to the city code. City code stuff says, you know, Cutting permits will not be not be issued for exceptional trees. Now, Mark, we're probably about to interrupt. There is a thing called a reasonable use exception, which says that if you can convince a hearing examiner, you can hire a lawyer and convincing a, a hearing examiner that protecting this tree is protect, keeping you from reasonable use of your property. That's some of that sort of appears in this memo. Then you can get it anyway. Um, but it's very explicit that you know that it, it has a lot of hurdles. It's according to the Drew, it's very similar to the critical areas. You can enforce, in fact, you know, get a permit to build on a steep slope or in a swamp, but you've got to work really hard. Um, and it's you know, you've got to explain to it, you know, explain to a hearing examiner why you have to take off this exceptional tree. But, and I I read the minutes of one of the hearing examiner uh, examinations and. My impression was in that particular case, he said, "Yeah, you don't need to take that tree out. You can build your build your out your uh, garage somewhere else. There are other places in your property you can build and not take that tree out." Now, I, that's one one examination, but you know, he he apparently he or she apparently looked at it pretty carefully and said, "Yeah, you know, this this tree does not need to be taken out." Or, yeah, oh. you know, you have really. Can... Sorry, no, I'm just going to say partly that it's also that's evidence that gets developed in the hearing. I, I, I'm, I'm sure that there's a public hearing involved with that, uh, that process. So, and, and there will be, you know, like in the case I think you're citing, there were expert people came in to testify about alternatives uh, to removing that tree in that case, or tree trees, I think is what I'm thinking of. So, so it's, it's, it's also had to go before the public essentially and uh, make this uh, claim uh, and this, this proposal. And then, subject to a lot of other ideas that can get introduced that, that could affect the hearing examiner's decision. Yeah. And there's probably precedent for what reasonable use actually is. If there are alternatives for that person to reasonably use their property while still leaving the tree in place, exactly. then they won't win. Yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, again, it's, it's the same protection as you get for critical areas. Yeah. Um, and the, the point of all this is these trees get a much higher level of protection than the other tree in the city. That means, I think, do we have to be uh, yeah. kind of, not not sort of, you know, say, well, everything over 24 inches is an exceptional tree. That, that would get thrown out of court, should, frankly. Everything over 24 inches is not exceptional. It's important. But I'm sort of in favor of keeping the term exceptional tree for the, the best of the best to a considerable degree. Having said that, the current code based on our recent survey, protects three quarters of 1% of the trees in the city. And that seems just a little bit tight to me. Uh, that's just a little bit too restrictive for the definition of an exceptional tree. My own vague sense of what constitutes exceptional is maybe one or 2%. But three quarters of 1% seems awfully low. 
what's the what's the percentage of landmark trees for other communities right like other communities call i guess we don't know right we don't know and that's actually a point that i want we, we need to get into the uh to this the memo that we make from so i'll tell you also make sure we get it in the numbers that are currently in there in the thing i do not know how they were developed but they were not developed on the basis of a survey like the one we're going to be talking about results up here um I don't know, John, do you know how they got such numbers? You better offer it. Yeah. But I, I actually asked at a council meeting five years ago, do we have this data on the trees so we can say how many trees are over the sky? And the answer was no. In fact, the data did exist. It was when one of these right hand didn't know what the left hand do. But it was buried in a, you know, it was buried in a uh, spreadsheet that had been submitted to the city that at some point somebody gave to me and I said, oh, this actually has the information we wanted. And I gave it to you, John, at that point. Yeah. And but at any rate, it was basically developed without a, uh, as far as I know, without a, a database of Lake Forest Park trees to work from. So if nothing else, we can say we provided a change because we now have some numbers to work from. But those numbers in themselves don't speak to why we would want to change it, do they? No, they really don't. I mean, they don't. It, it, you know, so, so we got, you know, and you can probably count the trees a bit when you get into three quarters of a percent. You're talking about very much. Well, I don't know. But well, you can handle it. It's better than 96,000 trees. It's a, you know, it's, it's a very serious problem. We yeah. don't have, our, our sample is not very large. So whether it be three quarters of, a per, of 1 percent is protected or one and a quarter percent is protected, um, the, I, those numbers in themselves, I don't think are convincing unless you have real, an understanding of why that three quarters of a difference, a percent difference is of importance to the city. Um, I think it's what that memo is trying to get at and what, what we need to be but I think talking about um, so like things like uh, the, the trees that are well, I don't know. Do you want to? Do you have more things? Oh, about yeah. Yeah. Or, I mean, for me, it's things like uh, what is the sequester sequestration value of a tree that's larger than twenty four inches? So I guess that's that's that is protected. I guess that is the exceptional tree size. Is it a reason to protect those trees because they are? Much better sequesters of uh, of, of, uh, of uh, greenhouse gases. And what's the health of our current exceptional trees? What's the health of our current exceptional trees? The right, health. if they're all the health, if yeah. they're all sort of on the verge of dying, we won't have any exceptional trees yet or left. Right. I don't know what, if we know. Impacts, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. forest. Yeah, that's actually in the code. If the tree is sick, it can't be exceptional. Really. I mean, it's, it's, it's not viable. If it's not viable, it's not exceptional. But are you talking about current? You I'm sort of saying, if you look at our, health. yeah, right. If you look at our current exceptional trees, one reason we would want to increase the diameter, or increase the diameter, are you saying decrease, decrease. Or, yeah, sorry, decrease the diameter to protect more trees, because the current exceptional trees are maybe at the end of their life lifespan. I don't actually know if this is yeah, true. I'm not sure how we can, <laughs> how, we, how we can could argue that really well. Yeah. There truly are some that are, some that probably aren't. Right. Yeah, that's where Drew comes in. She's she she knows. No, you you and I think Richard or was it you and Richard Doug that, that did some groundwork in terms of looking around when you were looking into these numbers. You actually did some surveys out of the city looking at the county county trees. Oh, what am I making that up? You know, it would be, so it was just data from the from the surveys. Data from the survey, survey. Yeah, six hundred eighteen trees from the surveys. Okay, and we're assuming. And as I'm going to point out at one point, it's at the it's sort of at the edge of a big enough sample. For many things, it's not a big enough sample. You know, we've done what we can do. We can't go out and do another survey of 600 more trees. Okay. So basically, Drew and I have looked at these lists of who's here and said, what do we think would be appropriate numbers for these different categories? Um, and where we could, we based it on the trees that are in the survey. Uh, where we couldn't, we either left it the same as it was or adopted another number that seemed reasonable to us. And that's not going to be hard to justify. So let me just actually start with the, the elephant in the room, it's Douglas fir. The current diameter limit for Douglas fir to become exceptional is 40, uh, 42, sorry. Um, our plan A would reduce that to 40. And it's really critical. Douglas fir is really critical 
because about uh, sixty percent of the trees over thirty inches or, or over thirty six inches, either one, are Douglas fir. So the number you protect of Douglas fir tells you a lot about what you're protecting for the city as a whole. So our our plan A is to reduce Douglas fir to forty. I would not be totally averse to keeping it forty two, but it would give the city give the trees less protection, and it would give us it, there's a lot of trees in that zone. So. But we'll go with that. And is is that your personal like thought process on why you wouldn't be averse to leaving it at forty two versus some of the others? Is that just because of the volume of them that we have? Yeah, and yeah, and because you know forty two protects um, forty protects about four and a half percent of the Douglas firs. Mm -hmm. Forty two protects about two percent. Um, it's kind of questionable. You have this question of whether it's an exceptional Douglas fir or just an exceptional tree. Forty between forty and forty-two is not really an exceptional Douglas fir, but it's still one of the biggest trees in the county. In the yeah. City. yeah. So this issue is going to come up. You know, is it an exceptional Douglas fir? Is it an exceptional red cedar, or is it you know exceptional tree? Yeah. And but I don't. I do think it's a worthy argument to say this is an exceptional tree to the community. Sorry. Right. I mean, it's a worthy argument to say that this is an exceptional tree to the community because that's exactly what other communities are doing mm -hmm. when they're talking about their 24 inch landmark trees. Right. It's, it may not be an exceptional tree in the grand scheme of things, but mm -hmm. it's important to the community itself. Okay. Well, what we're, we're going to be arguing in a minute, though, is that a 31 inch red cedar is an exceptional tree uh, because red cedar, as Mark has reminded us, Red cedar is a really important cultural important tree culturally in this area. Right. Um, it's a very important tree in this area. Um, there are no, there are almost no trees. Douglas fir is over forty, but there are. It's a number here. Um, about three percent of the red cedars are over 30, 30 centimeters, thirty inches. Sorry, too many years. Hmm. Academia. Uh, <laughs> about thirty percent. About three percent of the red cedars are over thirty inches. And that seems like a reasonable definition of an exceptional tree in the top 3%, particularly for a tree that has a lot of cultural importance. Uh, sort of go the same way with big leaf maple. Big leaf maple is sort of the only really common broadleaf tree we have here to get any size. Again, setting it at uh, 30 protects oh, about 3% of those trees. That seems like a rational number to protect. Do you have comparisons here of the, so the 3.2, I assume, is if it does get moved to 30. Do you have a percentage for what it is protected at 42? That's exactly the same. Okay. And so it's just a, just a sample size problem. There are two, in that survey, there are two big Douglas, big leaf maples. They're over 42s. So we can go anywhere from 30 to 42 okay. um, to protect. Now, that's obviously not true of the trees in the city, but we just have a small sample and just, and, you know, but for the Douglas fir, you said that the Douglas fir we have enough that we actually it you know, goes yeah. from um, forty two was that you said like two percent yeah two percent for if we said okay. forty two so um, the, would go from two to four point three and then did you have a stat for the cedars was it going from at forty two did you say it's effectively zero um, I have that number here somewhere I mean there's no chance of a taking with a big leaf maple right. You're saying, yeah, sorry. sorry. No, go ahead. What you say? I was just going to say, you're saying like there's literally no change in the percentage of no, it, because it's the, protected. There's, so, no, there's no change according to the survey. There's obviously isn't in the city. Yeah. I mean, when we can't confuse the city with the survey. Oh, the, city got it, got it, got it. the survey is represented the best thing we know about the city. Yeah, understood. Um, now, for red cedar, the numbers I have here 30 protects 2.8% of them, 36% presents 1.6%. 40 percent protect 1.2 percent, 42 protect 0 0.8 percent. That's not anything you've got. It's not right. It's calculated. So, okay. thank you. It's interesting, isn't it? Those are the, those are two of the three, I guess, but it's the largest change proposed for them we're considering here anyway. There is between 42 and 30 in both cases, and, and in many, as I say, in both cases, well. In the case of big leaf maple, it doesn't make any difference. In the case of, of uh, 
red cedar, currently we're protecting almost none of them. Wait a minute, you said for instance, maybe you say it didn't make any difference. It did, well, according to the shirt, obviously it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm talking about the city. We know there's going to be trees. Yeah. But then those two get a diameter. I mean, I guess in my mind, it goes back and forth between what's going to be kind of accept more acceptable in terms of um, you know being able to sell proposal that has an increase you know whether uh you know so in the mid range you know, we might want to consider uh or i don't know we may get some feedback on that if we talk to a few people about it well the 40 the 42 the current regu current rule protects 0 0.8 percent of the red cedars and 0.8 0 0.8 percent of the red cedars with the one the rules currently on the books what is it oh that, that that's less than one percent yeah oh that that just for a tree that's as important as red cedar is that just seems too too big mm -hmm. i would i don't want to put i certainly want to set the one lower than that but not necessarily down 30. Mm -hmm. you know this is the number drew and i came up with the other trees on here are trees that you just don't have or many of so we don't really have any data Say how big they would have to be. Uh, there's the next one on the list is firs, all all fur species. There's one one fur in the survey. It's about eight inches, I think. It's a, a sub alpine fur. So, where are you now on this list? Is that a grand? Yeah, well, it started out as grand first, not as fur. We're centers to say only 80s grand as we're saying any furs. Okay. Okay. Uh, we basically set that as 30 because that's before we set the others at. Uh, same thing for Western Hemlock. It's another important tree in this area. Uh, there's none in the sample. I mean, it's only a very small business. I think there's a half a dozen in the sample, but they're all fairly small. Um, a 30 inch uh, Western Hemlock would be an exceptional Western Hemlock in this area, in this city. Western White Pine, uh, there's only four in the city. One of them happens to be over 30 inches. So, this four point, in the survey. Mm -hmm. Four in the survey. survey. Four on the survey. I said seventy-five percent. I think it must be twenty-five percent. It's a, it's, a, it's, you know, it's, it's a tiny little survey. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's one that's thirty-one inches. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's one. I, seventy-five percent is one. But anyway, two things we've added on here, and I really wish Drew was here to describe it because these are ones she was big interested in. Mm -hmm. Shore pine. Uh, she has. She has a document that sort of says, you know, which trees provide exceptional environmental values, just habitat, fruit, things like that. Short pine is really high on the list for this area. Um, so, and they don't, they don't get very big. There, there's, I think there's one here now, it's about eight inches. We put that in at 16 inches, but we thought that it was, it, it fits so high on these sort of environmental values. We wanted to make it pretty well protected. Mm -hmm. And kind of the same thing for the oaks, the oaks, there's again almost none in the city. Um, but we wanted to put it in protect. We wanted to get oaks in there especially protected. And so we put 30 as a number that was consistent with the other numbers. And the last one is one that I'm interested in is the everything else. Because the current code, a tree can be 50 inches in diameter and not get any protection if it doesn't have to be one of these six species. Now one of the things we've talked about in the past, and one of the one of the things that comes in this King County Guide to Protecting Trees on, on uh, public land is that um, you know, not all trees are equal. That, uh, red cedar is important culturally, um, so is lodgepole pine, so is big leaf maple. Um, but there's certain things that trees provide just by being big. A big tree has more biomass. A big tree sequesters more carbon. It, has more carbon sequestered, it has more carbon uptake. And it doesn't really matter a lot whether it's a Deodar cedar or a Douglas fir. Those things come just from being big. And so I didn't like it. I didn't like the fact that the old code didn't protect, you know, even very big trees of species that didn't happen to be in the list. So we have put in here uh, everything else. Uh, and we talked about saying native trees or conifers or broad leaves, but uh, Drew says, well, you know, if you put in native trees, somebody's going to argue, well, it is a native tree, or no, it's not native, so it doesn't occur, and wouldn't have occurred naturally in Lake Florida Park. And then, hopefully, there didn't seem to be a real reason for it. We just say everything, anything over 40 inches we put in. Again, that number could be changed a little bit, and it's another number that's 
we just don't have enough trees in that size. To, you know, there, there are two two trees that fall in that category. Uh, I think over 30 inches, actually, or 30 or 36. Um, they both have to be over 42. So we put in 40 as a reasonable number. So to me, that raises the question of, for the sake of simplicity, if we are adding everything an everything else category, are there any of the other ones that, especially ones that you said there's virtually none of in the city, that then don't need to be specifically called out if they are falling under a catch-all category anyway? Well, for example, Western Hemlock, we, we would currently set it at 30. That would give more protection, a Western Hemlock more protection than if it just fell into the everything else category. That's for the things that we've listed. Oh, I, I forgot my drone is on there, too. Again, it's, it's an unusual tree. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's again, there's none of those in the, none of those in the survey. So most of these things, the, the fir, the shore pine, the oaks, and the madrona, are not going to have a big impact on developers. I mean, since that really is kind of the underlying issue, I believe all this. It's not going to keep very many people from doing what they want to do with their land. Um, it will give them a little bit, but, but, but it would give them a little bit better chance, chance to be protected if something does come along they want to take out a good size tree. So I have another question about how you came to the numbers. So it looks like you looked at a lot of how many are there, what are their sizes, how much percentage wise would we be right. protecting at different sizes? Did you factor in or look at all at any consistency in how long it takes <laughs> for the trees to get on average to that size? No, I didn't. I'm not sure I would be able to do that. It depends so much on the soil quality of the soil and the watering and things like that. But yeah. I don't think it, I don't think you could generalize on the scene. And it's and actually something to know something about it. it. It's a huge variation in tree growth rate depending on the conditions. Yeah, I was curious, it, like based on in the last the list we looked at last time had things like what's the average 30 year canopy cover? Right. Like obviously that's gonna change. It's not gonna be the same for every tree based on conditions, et cetera. Right. Um, I'm just curious whether there's there's any argument to be made when we're looking at such a small sample size for like currently there's zero big leaf maples right. that fall into this category. So what is the difference? Are we saying that this is a standard that could potentially be reached at 30 years instead of 50 years? Like what is what is the likelihood we have trees that will meet this standard if none currently right. do in our sample size? Yeah, so we certainly do have a list of how many, it would in the sample, because again, 618 trees out of 300,000 in the city. But yeah. Within the sample, you know, we could look and say, well, there's so many big leaf maple between 24 and 30, which I don't know that number, but uh, you know, it never exists. And um, I think a, a reason is once it gets to that size, the big leaf maple is important, so important to the diversity of our tree canopy, or it's something that Lake Ward Park cares about, the diversity of its large tree canopy that we would want to save it. And the underlying reason for changing all of these numbers is because too few, we feel as a, a board or the surveyors that there are too few trees being protected at this particular exceptional. I mean, I think that's one of the most important rationales that we can have. And the other thing is that some trees can't get protected by well, Thing. Some trees can't get protected at all if they're the wrong species. Right. And there are, there is a 48 exactly. inch day of our cedar sitting around here somewhere and a 48 inch Norway spruce somewhere. And there's a 20, a 57 inch tulip tree that appeared in the previous survey, but out of this one. And again, none of those trees would get any protection yeah. unless we at least put in an, an everything else category at some level. Exactly. I, I, I think that's an important change to make in the law that rules. And we protect, uh, so, so, protect 0.6% of the but the other trees actually get protected. How easy would it be for someone to cut down one of those huge trees that's not specifically identified? Someone just buys a property and decides to cut it down, right? Um, they so would, they would, yeah, they but, would still fall under the major tree permit process, right? correct? It would be a landmark tree, yeah. yeah. So you would still need approval from uh, Drew or Drew's position to cut it down. It's just not <laughs> as and hard as, of a bar to pass. What What is the... What's Drew's bar for allowing something like that to be removed at the landmark stage and the exceptional stage? 
I'm just curious. Yeah, I wish she was here, but she yeah. was her sister's wedding. <laughs> Perhaps that's something that you know, Elizabeth or Mark could chime in on. Uh, no, I I leave that to her position. That's what she gets paid. <laughs> My answer to that is it's a code <laughs> basis adopted in Lake Forest Park Municipal Code. The the actual wording is um, her expertise. Is what? It's her expertise. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, it's not arbitrary. It's not um, to exaggerate. It's not how she feels that day or who the applicant is. The criteria right. is adopted uh, in the code, and that's what she administers, implements. Okay. Can I throw one thing? Okay. There is a channel. If somebody's issued a tree permit, it's possible to uh, protest cutting down that tree. I, I know this, I've participated in a couple when it goes right. to the hearing examiner. Um, you do have to pay about $500 to do that because it requires you know, the hearing examiner. Right. So you have to be quite serious about it. Um, so it is another, another channel. Sure. So, which is in the code. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, so the flip side of the, of the reason to use the exception that says you don't have to ignore you can ignore these things is the hearing thing that no, I can this I can is yeah, this is separate than the RUE. No, it is. Yeah. But it's but it's the other side of it that a treaty would be they could they would allow it to be cut and be protested by citizens. Correct. Um a tree that's not allowed to be cut can be protested by the yeah, person who wants to cut it. Yeah, and it's a challenging process, but it is classic. When did that start? That's that's always been in the code. Um, it got amended. Thank you. You guys amended that to make. There was a loophole where you can't remember the exact loophole now. But the loophole there was a time was that, that while there was, I think, a two week window where someone could lodge an appeal, the developer could cut down the tree during that window. That happened to me. And so at that point, when you launch the appeal, but the tree's been cut down, so and that uh, and that loophole's now yes, like you got council okay. that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that must have changed. I'm looking at the tree code right now. It looks like Thank you. Drew has to determine canopy coverage on the property, and if that canopy coverage exists on the property, and they want to cut down one tree, as long as that tree canopy coverage goal is met, they can still cut it down. Um, I would also, in, sir, uh, may I ask a thing? Yeah, go ahead. Um, if you look at the requirements for a major tree permit, and so one of those talks about demonstrate the following prioritized factors for retention, and then it lists uh, roads, exceptional landmark, critical areas, and then others. So I, my understanding is it's not just a matter of someone saying, I want to cut this tree down, that they would have to explain, well, you know, why is this sort of, you know, in order, you know, how am I avoiding growth, like removing a growth? And then how am I avoiding removing, you know, could this have been done without removing any exceptional trees or without removing landmark? So there does need to be sort of a systematic approach for a developer. That's the way I'm interpreting our code. If you want to read it, it's uh, section 16.14.070. Uh, uh, if you want some reading material. Or you can just search the code for the word exceptional. And it pops up too, because I read it earlier. Okay. Um, okay, so that's sort of what we've done. Oh, I know the other, other question somebody asked. Uh, and again, it's not on the, it's not anything that we'll ever present, especially because it's too vague. But using very broad calculations, plan A, which, uh, that's a mistake. Oh, well. Plan A, which is Douglas for 40, not 42, um, protects about, well, that's why this is my note, protects about 18% of the leaf area and 25% of the biomass of the city. So the, the reason is that you get so much bang for your buck by protecting a large tree. There's so much carbon there. There's so much leaf area there that it's demonstrative protects of leaf area and biomass is disproportional to the number of trees you protect. You present 2% of the trees, but you present 20% of the leaf area. Um, you know, the other the other options I had other numbers for, but they all work out about the same area. You get way, way more protection of leaf area than you do with biomass, which is why I don't feel any inclination to go, you know, despite the climate action base urging 
don't feel any inclination to go more stringent to, to go more uh, more stringent let's say lower diameter limits uh, this i mean exceptional tree definition should not be the main thing we use that trees in our city main thing we use that huge trees but it's not the main thing that will keep our city forested um, and but it does nevertheless with any of the numbers we've got here protect a pretty good chunk of biomass a pretty good chunk of leaf well, is and why is that important to the city again that we have your wife just explained it to us on biomass your wife just explained it to us i mean is it the same thing as sequestration it is yeah it's so best return well i think that's the, the it's, i think sequestration speaks to me definitely these trees seem to be working harder in that respect that when they get to a certain size uh and i suppose the 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 the, the leaf exposure is another way that that process happens that they're bigger person so i'm i, I just think i want to, and that that begins to to me to be something that you know as a more concrete reason why these larger why these numbers to protect more trees you know would be worthwhile for the city to to do i, I wonder if there's something similar in terms of stormwater Stormwater control, was there a case to be made for larger trees uh, being uh, deserving more protection because of their increased value and increased function in stormwater runoff control? Uh, I'm sure there is. That would be probably. Uh, so that might be something out of the week. Yeah. Again, the, 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 particularly the number of biomass is a really crude number. Of leaf, yeah. Leaf area tends to be pretty proportional to the square of the diameter. So you've got, you know, a 30 inch tree is going to have nine times more leaf area probably than a 10 inch tree. Would you guess that there's something that we could find about the exceptional, these larger trees and stormwater, increased stormwater value? That there's, that there's yeah. probably lots of graduate studies. I, I just did a very quick Google search that said, Why are larger trees better? <laughs> Hey, there we go. Air quality, <laughs> stormwater management. <laughs> Large trees can help with stormwater management. Um, I mean, there's a whole list yeah. that I think we could use in our rationale as to why we want to increase the yeah. diameter of these. Um, privacy, climate change, wildlife habitat, energy savings, stormwater management, property values, mental and physical health. That was the other one. One of those points was also in my list of habitat. Yeah, right. wildlife habitat. So do those larger trees provide? Large trees provide food and shelter for greater a greater amount of like food and shelter for wildlife. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, and, yeah, <laughs> much more, but much more diverse. Like, well, actually, that reminds me. Of the, there is an answer to the question. I have it could be an answer to the question. There is a program called I Tree, where you can plug in the diameter of an individual tree and it provides a lot of. This is the numbers, the numbers the report comes from I trees in the whole city, but you can also do it from an individual tree. And while I haven't tried doing it, I'm almost certainly plug in 10 inches diameter, you know, Douglas fir 10 inches in diameter in my backyard. It's worth actually 30 inches in my backyard is worth Y for stormwater retention or stormwater prevention. I mean, it's not a number I really believe, but it's a number that we yeah, no, I'm traceable to I'm a sure professional sure. source. I'm sure we can around and find something incredible. I'm going to try, which is really. That, that last, that other point that we talked about, cultural values, uh, at least you mentioned uh, two of those trees anyway. Yeah. Uh, that seems to be a little harder category to kind of quantify in terms of the question, why is preserving cultural values important because it makes for a bar? I'm sure there's, I feel in my heart that there's a yes answer to that, but I have to struggle with articulating that. Is there something in sort of the city charter? Do, do we have a charter of some sort that? Well, that'd be, we're a welcoming city. We're, yeah. uh, we're a compassionate city, compassionate city from proclamations we've made in the past. We're, yeah, we're a tree city. Aren't we a tree city? We are. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's pretty basic. <laughs> yeah. if, you read, if you read through the code, there's all sorts of repetitions about what trees are. Exactly. Yeah. On that topic, uh, when the city has when the town has made major changes, what we've done is to put sort of an introduction into that chapter of the code. It's kind of the big picture. Why is this chapter here? What's the and so for trees, I think we, we have something like that that ex, that gets at you know what's the mission statement? Why do we have an entire chapter devoted to tree protections? You find some stuff in the comp plan too, even the old. Current 
Yeah. So, I mean, so municipal code, municipal code chapter 16.14 is tree preservation. And the entire first section, um, section 010, is really just the introduction. It's explaining all of that. It's the, it's the preamble to the actual meat of the code, explaining the importance of trees. Mm. Yep. Purpose and intent. And so if it was the tree board's recommendation that cultural sensitivity should also be a factor, you, by, you know, by all means, recommend that to the city council that we should amend the policy statement to not just talk about environmental benefit, but to also talk about cultural preservations. I point out that there's been a few big fights in Seattle about trees, you know, big trees being cut down, and the cultural the fact that it had been marked by Native Americans was always a huge issue. I think mean, it's probably the deciding issue. So the tree, this tree was. The Native Americans said this tree was reared by our ancestors. They marked it here and it appeared to carry a great deal of weight in preventing it. I don't, I don't know where it did. It was certainly brought up and it seems to be the thing everybody talks about. So, I, I, yeah. Now, that doesn't mean we only protect trees that have been marked by Native Americans. So it had been shown signs of having bark got a bit. I, the tree where Oli Hansen carved his initials. Right. Yeah. Somewhere in the city we could find him. Sure. <laughs> well, that done a good job of explaining that. I think the rationale for that. It's, it, I don't know. I think it's a discussion about whether those are the right numbers or before we discuss, like, what the uh, essay, what the, what the memo that we want to put together. Start working on with David. Um, I guess basically, yeah. do we think that you all you all think that Plan A is too too restrictive, uh, too generous? I mean, is there a direction that most people think we're gone? We've gone wrong in. And then that's specifically Douglas Fir. So Douglas Fir is the simplest thing to change. Easiest thing to change. Okay, so the plan A refers yeah. to the no, the new numbers that, that are yes, here. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So that's plan A. Plan B would be to keep on those first 42, which would come up. Right. Right. But plan B would also be to keep all the numbers, all the numbers as they are. That's my question. Was no, plan B is plan A refer just to Douglas Spurs? Plan, so plan A refers to all the numbers. Yeah. Plan B refers to. Exactly the same numbers, except changing Douglas fur to all oh, I see. I see. I see. 42. Yeah. That. And plan B is my, my terminology. I see. But the two alternatives that seem to be distinct. You know, we could look at changing the individual diameters for the different species. None of them will make a great deal of difference practice, except possibly red cedar. Um, again, because we have such lovely data about big, uh, big, big people. But I think about 30 inch, you know, 30 inch tree is a big tree. So I think, you know, if we get a, a, a 30 inch tree of a tree we think is important, being these maple and red cedar, uh, and again, this is just purely psychological on me. It seems like that's getting the size approach where somebody ought to have a really good explanation for cutting it down. Not just a good explanation, but a really good explanation, just a difference between land market. Exceptional side reading code. I appreciate all of the kind of detail you put in with us. I like how you've explained where where you're at with all the numbers based on everything you've explained. I think most of my questions come into when we're writing the memorandum to go with it. Um, how are we going to justify the numbers beyond, especially for the ones that you don't have a justification in the percentage change, but even with the ones we do have a percentage, like, okay, we think 4% is better than two. Right. Okay, why? <laughs> so, like, figuring out and working through, like, what would be the content in there and the justification behind um, the changes where most of my questions come in, not, I think, the numbers look great. Everything you've explained about your process sounds great. I totally agree with you. That's going to be, like, the critical piece is figuring out how to justify. Just that if you take Doug Furs as an example, we have to justify why we're moving from 40 to 42. And I think a good base like base justification for why we're moving all of the diameters is that too few of those trees are currently 
protected as exceptional trees and why do we care about that? I think we'll have to articulate that in the memo that we craft and then we will have a chance of the support that we need, I think, for the lawyer to sort of sign off on yeah. it. So that, just actually something Larry brought up a long, some time ago. Do we use this exceptional tree to increase and improve the diversity of our tree canopy? Yeah. Which is kind of what you're saying. That's what if saying. we want to improve the reverse diversity of our tree canopy, we can't do it by setting uh, you know, uh, some of the we can't do it by keeping the original number. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Uh, that should be the certainly... beginning of our statement. Yeah. 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 The, the percentage that you mentioned, the changes in percentage, I think is very helpful, kind of secondary, secondary support for this argument. I, I think the primaries are the things that tangible benefits to the city that, that we can uh, articulate. Uh, and then the fact that, you know, that those numbers would add what says we've got a number of, of protected trees in some of those categories, uh, whatever it would be, would be, would be a good support for that. Any other comments? The uh, number? Dick's been on. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure Make sure he can see if he has any comments. Dick? Any comments, Dick? I uh, know I've really appreciated the work that you and Drew put in on this, and I'm supportive of it. I'd say that we probably won't protect any Pinus contorta with a 16 inch minimum diameter because there probably aren't any. But no, there uh, are. are there? No, there's one eight inch one. So no, but really. 16 inch. Right. Yeah. The number of inches. Yeah. But that's fine. I mean, it's a, uh, you know, it's good. Um, I think protecting all oaks over 30 is good. It would be hard to specify which species. I know some people think of uh, English oak Quercus rober as being sort of uh, semi-invasive, and some of them get really big. But uh, probably any big ones we have are ones that people have planted as a specific you know, specimen tree, and I think that they should be preserved if they're that big. So I'm good with this. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So I want to make sure I'm not putting my hand on the scale since I'll get a chance to weigh in later. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, I, I think there's a few questions that you should think about as you move on to the consideration, some of which have been brought up. So the questions that come to me are, why 2%? So what's your justification for making it 2% across uh, protection across the city? Um, if the goal is 2%, how come you chose numbers that lead to 3 or 4% for certain species? So what it, well, I'm, I'm not trying to criticize, but like, what's your justification for 4% of Douglas firms? And then what is your justification when there are species that are so small in quantity, they're not really in the inventory? What is your justification for those diameters? So I think those are some key questions that you'll want to address to just to make it this as strong a proposal as possible. So we didn't we didn't start out with, with 2% and work down. And, we started out with these numbers and said, what does it give us? So that's that, that is actually the direction that numbers went. You know, when, when I saw that, I tried a couple of things that went up to the three and 4% range, and I said, you know, that's too much. So, but this this list here on that first table is pretty much what we came up with before I had to map the spreadsheets taken care of to see what it would actually do. Because of the same thing, whether that in order, not the other way. And then I was, you know, yeah. then, you know, after we did it, we said, yeah, 1.9%, that's not too bad. Well, if you go to keep up for 42, 1.6%, that isn't real bad either. I mean, that's that's a reasonably de good definition of exceptional. It fits within my idea of what constitutes exceptional. But we did actually start with the individual trees and work the other direction. So we don't have to explain why we did that. <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't expecting an answer tonight. It's just yeah. as you plan this for the November tree board meeting, some, some things to think about. Well, is it too early to start talking about how we get a draft, draft of a demo out? Or Dick's got his hand raised. I just wanted to note that with the respect to the 
higher number of Douglas fir trees would be saved for the tree canopy in Lake Forest Park, Douglas firs, the larger Douglas firs really anchor that canopy uh, in places like where, where we want to have connectivity for wildlife in particular through the parks, through the, the various uh, drainages that are and steep hillsides and things like that. So, you know, I think the justification for keeping uh, a higher percentage of Douglas fir is can be um, based on the, simply the their increased importance in our overall tree urban forest. They are the they're back they're the backbone of the forest basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in my mind, that's something that that would be critical to put in this memo, yeah. because otherwise you might leave you know, the city might be open to an accusation that it's, you know, it's arbitrary that you've chosen different percentages for different species. But then to explain, well, why is Douglas fir a very special species? I think that is really important. Right? And for the ones where we don't have any trees, but you've indicated a diameter you would want to protect. I think a good justification is, well, we have some of those trees in the community. Once they get to that diameter, we want to protect them because they are the only large versions of those trees that the community would have, further increasing the diversity of the canopy. And, and to point out, of course, Douglas fir is a tree we're giving the least protection to. Right. Except mm -hmm. maybe, not, well, actually others do the same thing. Uh, but again, the, I mean, Dick's point is that even though it's the most common tree in the forest, because it's the most common tree in the forest, it provides a connectivity and a, a, a structure to the forest that no, no other tree provides. And that, you know, with Douglas fir providing 60% of the large trees, that's not really arguable. It's, 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 it defines our forest. So protecting a few more of them is not a, a sin. I like that fact you said. Hey, anything else on this? Well, I just was wondering about the next step. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I guess I don't, not sure about the timing that we're, timeline we're working on in terms of doing this. I don't think we're working on an urgent timeline. And we've got some other stuff that we've talked about as a tree board that we might like to bring to the council at some point. And I would point out, and um, if Dirk Hoffman wants to weigh in as well, um, he is very busy right. uh, both with his department's budget and then the comp plan. And so the city council is not going to be taking this up until 2025. Right. And so that will take some of the time pressure off. Um, if you concur. Absolutely. That's the discussion we've had going forward. There is a challenge to put anything on the agenda through December. Um, and there's just so many meetings and we have staffing issues. Um, and one thing waiting in the winds is even just getting a contract to update our shoreline management uh, program. But that said, um, uh, as director uh, cut loose, drew to work independently to develop one or two ordinances to get the work done. So it is ready when the um, opportunities for public hearing come up. So the work can absolutely continue, is not reliant on, on waiting for me to understand it. Uh, I suppose what I, go forward. Uh, yeah, I suppose what I'm saying is don't feel pressured that you have to approve recommendations at your November meeting. Right. Because, yeah, there's no rush. You know, if you approve it at the December meeting, it's still going to be on the very same agenda sometime early 25. My only actual timeline is that I'm stepping down as tree board chair, passing over to Mark, probably in Dick, why did you turn it over to me? But March, April, September, I think, was it? I think the end of February is when the rules say uh, new officers have, are supposed to be elected or something like that. So I, I kind of like this done before I move on. And, and when did we decide was that month again? You said in February. February. Okay. Yeah, I thought it was February or March. Anyway, but that's. Yeah, that's kind of the same time schedule, actually. It is. It is. And of course, obviously, if it doesn't happen, I'll continue to represent. Well, is there some natural way that people see that we would start working on this? Are there, are there particular people who want to work on it in the first draft of this uh, statement, this memo? It's my question. We want to start working on it. Probably. <laughs> Simplest thing would be Drew and I would put together 
something as a first draft, and then I guess I can't pass it off to the whole council. Alone. She can, though. She can pass off the council to the tree board, so I like council. Uh, yeah, I would, I would love to contribute to it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I would, if, if you and Drew jot down, like, the, some of your thinking behind the changes, when you guys were talking about it through conversations and stuff, I would like to jump in. Yeah. And I would point out probably the best way to do this that avoids any public meeting issues is for Drew to be the clearinghouse. Right. Yeah. So once you uh, the the subcommittee comes up with a draft, Drew can send that draft to the entire tree board and tell yeah, and any tree board members can provide their feedback directly to Drew. And then she can compile that feedback. And then you present it at your next tree board meeting. Right. So that was public. So what I think I'll probably do is put together. Um, if, if you guys have took notes on uh, district questions, send, send them to me individually, not not to the whole board, but send them to me individually. Yeah, I just put I may just put down a list of bullet points that I think we might start from, um, and then maybe Drew can work with that. He's been through my job for weeks. He's probably behind everything else. Mm -hmm. um, so she can do a draft of that, and then maybe what she drafts, she can put out to Stacy and I. We can take a look at it. I got a few thoughts for what I was saying to them. I can put on. Send it to you. Yeah, please. No, anything, anything that would be helpful to death is good. You know, to start a memo being written. And I think ultimately, you know, it's going to have to be looked at by the lawyer anyway to get make it sound even remotely legal. We can write a, a you know, like, not a layman's justification, but a, a non, what's the option of the lawyer? Gentile? No. <laughs> uh, a non, a non lawyer's this, what, what we think we're talking about. Opposite lawyer. That's, there must be a joke there. You know. <laughs> um, we got uh, about 15 minutes. Yes, so we had some things to talk about top song transit. Who does? Okay. Oh, oh, actually, no. So, so, so Drew and I write this memo based on plan A, uh, 48 struggles for, and then yes, if city council doesn't like it, we'll say, well, here's plan B. <laughs> Come back to it later. Strictly speaking, the city council. They, we will take your yeah and under advisement. I mean, we can make our own changes, but I think there's there does tend to be a, a fair bit of deference to what the tree board thought the other day. And I think it's up for discussion and modification just within our group too. Once we get a good draft in front of us, that's true. There's no reason we have to keep the same numbers. So we might have draft would change all over the Yeah. Okay. Um, Mark, were you the one who put the sound transit update on? I wasn't planning on it, but I'm always available for a nut sound transit update. The biggest part is there no permits have been submitted as of this minute. And it's not likely that's going to happen until spring. We continue to talk about review issues, uh, mitigation, um, potentially changing the design. That will continue. So between now and, and uh, early 2025, that's likely the status. As far as we know, they literally could come in tomorrow with any number of permits, but we don't think they will. Um, that said, what they refer to as the 100% design exists. It's on our city website. That's not our title. Our title will be when they submit the uh, proposed design. That that won't occur for some time. And then uh, Council Member Goldman mentioned an update of a September 25th response letter from the interim CEO, Gorin. I can't remember, I can't recall his last name. Yeah, essentially responding to the council's letters um, with a lot of recitals, a lot of uh, past background and thank you. Um, very appreciative letter. Um, but the key sentence in there was that they're going forward as is. Put another to put that another way, they basically have rejected the the Q jump plan, so they they will be moving forward with the original bus lane plan. Really did make a lot of sense the way you described it. I've been meaning to give Jeff a call to just follow up. He when he was here, he had some meetings on the horizon. He was not quite get important, so maybe that was the outcome. Anyway, not too bad to hear that. Not surprising, but too bad. Oh, by the way, I don't think I ever thanked Jeff for presentation for me. 
in the freeboard site. So it should be something. And and we'll see. Staff's perspective is we'll, we'll know the status when they submit active permits to the city. So being optimist, there's always opportunity for them to change course. Economy may change, um, but the latest letter from a week ago indicates their 100% design is their intent next year. <laughs> so thinking about the tree diameters, is there a, would this have an impact on the permit? Does that sound transit applies for? Like for their right of way permits. If let's say there's a tree along Bothell Way that is currently not exceptional, but would become exceptional under amended diameters. Or would this be you know kind of superseded by the right of way permit application they make? Well, when when we're in application review, they will vest with building permits, um, not applications of permits. And so we'll apply the regulations in place at that time. If there are assets, trees that grow into those categories in the future, they will be subject to the, the new regulations in place. How that how that influences Drew's tree permit reviews, say in 2025, um, she, the mitigation will be based on that. Preservation will be based on that. Uh, if, if the question is, what about in three years and can we restrict it now? Not likely. Can we implement it in three years? Absolutely. And that would be in the lap of whoever owns that property. No, we have it. I think, you know, not to be uh, I'm skeptical to say, but it's going to be fairly hard for them to avoid to take out the trees they need. To, they think they need to take out. I mean, it's not like saying you can put the carport on the other side of your house. Well, they're probably not going to move the lane from one side to the other of off away to accommodate two landmark trees or even two exceptional trees. Um, but. If I understand your question correctly, though, it wasn't, are there trees that are going to meet these standards? It was, are there trees that are 35 inches? And right yes. now they wouldn't be exceptional, but if we change to these, they would be as soon as that's passed. Yeah, like for instance, correct? yeah, exactly. So if let's say there's a 39 inch Western red cedar, currently that is a landmark tree. If this were to be passed, that oh. would be promoted to an exceptional tree. Would that have any practical impact, or is this one of the? It's an essential public facility, and so the tree would have to come down regardless of how we are classifying it. Landmark or exceptional wouldn't matter at that point. Is the question correct? Yeah, that's undetermined. Know? Yeah, I wouldn't determine that in this setting. <laughs> they would be subject to the rules in place, adopted, active, current in that time. It's not realistic. I think it's sort of right, and so I think that's where I'm like, it's a. I'm thinking my question might be a good point because it's the, the legal term is essential public facility, which grants Sound Transit a fair bit of autonomy on making sure that they 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 have a fair bit of power to make sure the project gets built, and that applies to any of our regulations, doesn't it? That are in effect at any time they might determine. That yes. they have a priority project. Like There's a, a section in the code that says when a, when the proposed tree removal is associated with major development activity, the trees may be removed. If a tree replacement plan is approved, that at a minimum brings canopy coverage to the applicable canopy coverage goal. So basically, all they have to do is it's provide a, a tree. The wrong section of the code, though. This is the major tree permits. What? It's the major tree permit section. We have major a, tree permits. Yeah, but th th this is a, a special kind of permit. It's brand new section of code that was written later in the day. Yes, yeah, you 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 should look for the right of way tree okay. permit okay. or the right of way corridor. Oh, corridor, yeah. Yeah. corridor yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We there's a special whole section of code that we wrote was written specifically for this situation, but for any other situation where a major entity wants to do a major job going down a road. Uh, and the rules are just all different. I see it. And we also wrote 
the same time wrote a uh, code that actually covered the tree strips along the street because we didn't have one before apparently they weren't covered so the gist of what i'm understanding is even if we propose and the new exceptional tree guidelines are passed and it means they go from a proposal whenever they submit permits from proposing to cut down 10 exceptional trees to 20 because we changed the standard it doesn't matter but we uh yeah, but again, yeah, this is these are the rules for the, every development in the city. Until they, until they revise it, somebody revised it again, I want that right up the street. Work. So, and, and its impact is going to be tree by tree around the city, not on the corridor. Yeah. On the, yeah, the corridor. I was going to say, it just came up in what Sarah was telling us about that event on October 26th, where she was inviting a tree board to. Oh, right. Yes, yeah, that. Because we want to put a table there for that. I wish it was something other than a table. We could do something a little bit more creative. It's it. We yeah. have a good time with that. People like Grace show up after we do those things. I'll be around on the 26th and, and be available for all or part of that time. Um, anybody else? Victoria, you're good at that. I am hoping to be out of town that day, but I could yeah, be yeah. in town if needed. <laughs> Can you get marked trees? Uh, yeah, trees? the all of the stuff that I had, the coloring pages and all of that are in the box that Elizabeth has. You could, that Elizabeth has? Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Well, anybody else who might like to do, to, to do that, to let me know. Uh, meanwhile, I'll start seeing if I can think of something might make that a little special. It's kind of a really cool idea to set up this climate hub, kind of a centrum of information about climate. And uh, we can maybe even just think about what our trees work about the region. <laughs> anyway, maybe that's enough for now on that topic. I okay to proceed with that, at least on some limited basis. Please, 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 please. You're having some presence there. Please. Okay. What is the 26th? It's the 26th, right? Is it a Saturday? Yes. Yeah. 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 I might be able to join you, Mark. Okay. Put my name down. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're going to talk about tree planting a bit. We have time. I hope. I think my walk trail. 853. Um, well, maybe we don't need to talk about it much. I don't know. I went out and looked at Richard and Ted made some suggestion about the, about the reservoir. I uh, and I think it was the south, the southeast corner. There's one tree there now. Looks like at one point there were two. There were three uh, Chinese fringe, tree, fringe trees, um, Pyonanthus retusus. I think we maybe should ask Drew if she could check with commercial nurseries in the area and see if they're available. It would be nice to replant the two that died. There were three there. All, I know there are three on the southwest corner. There were three on the southeast corner also. Okay. And there, that's a different tree than what's on the southwest corner. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, we've talked about this before and seemed to have come up short with ideas about where we were tree planting. And, uh, you know, not feeling that it's really something obligatory for us to do, but uh, it's kind of nice to be able to do it. Are we glad to know that? Go ahead. Well, it's certainly fine to do it for Arbor Day. Because I have no idea for the next Arbor Day cycle. Uh, yeah. I don't know. It would be nice to replace those two simply because they were a tree board uh, planting to begin with. Yeah. And it would create the symmetry with the three parodias over on the other corner. Uh, you want to send me the, which you mentioned is the names of those trees? And I'll, sure. I Follow up with Drew to ask her about nursery stock. Yeah, I'll send it to you and Drew. And, and then I guess if we could get that, if, if, then, then we need a plan for how to do that. If we want to try and do it before, uh, you know, it, before the, the dead of winter, or if we want to wait until uh, February or something, or does it matter? Anytime in the next couple of months is optimal, I think. Yeah. Does anybody know if we can count that as our Arbor Day tree event? We didn't need to do a tree event every year for Arbor Day. Uh, yeah. 
well, it wouldn't be Arbor Day that would be planted, but you know, we could. I think having some pre planting activity counts towards that, that requirement. Yes, uh, my understanding is that there needs to be a proclamation and there needs to be a tree ordinance. And so the proclamation will be on our Arbor Day, but the actual celebration event does not have to be that day. I see. Okay, so we could do that in November or something like that. Well, that will be pretty quickly. If you can move things fast enough to have it in November, then. Yeah, so, uh, well, we'll see if the train's available. And if it, I guess at our November meeting, uh, we, we probably want to announce it to the public and maybe a couple of people will come by and help us. Or, um, you're thinking like a Saturday towards the, well, then you got Thanksgiving early, early December. Is that getting too far into winter? Is that, that, that no, okay? November would be better probably, but uh, early December, depending on how our winter starts or no yeah, right. Okay. We will let you two work on that and you two and Drew work on that and then we'll put it on the agenda for the next meeting. Perfect. Should anything else be in the agenda for the next meeting? It's obviously the, the tree memo, the tree size memo. Anything else? Anything from our publicity department? We can have a short, we can have a short report on the, uh, whatever you guys do at uh, the climate up kick off, but I don't know if that needs to be an agenda, agenda, an agenda item. Mm -hmm. Any other business? Uh, Eric Baldwin, would you hear? Anybody tired of being here? <laughs> I move the adjourn. Second. All in favor? Thank you all. Thank you. What is the the perfect way thing from the minute last night? Sorry.